Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I guess now, if you're on the East Coast. Welcome to the Environmental Law Institute's Community Lawyering Part 3 event. This is the third part of our Community Lawyering for Environmental Justice series. This third part will be discussing conflict checks. I want to take a moment to thank our wonderful panelists for being here today and for their time spent preparing a great program for you all. I also want to thank our audience for taking the time this afternoon to tune in. We greatly appreciate your presence here. Today's event will consist of an introduction from our moderator, Christine, followed by short presentations by each panelist about how they handle conflict checks in their work. After that, we will have a roundtable discussion focusing on spe special considerations with conflict checks with time at the end for audience questions. You can find a full agenda along with a worksheet for the event on the event page on ELI's website, the one that you used to register. Um, we'll have all of that there. We do encourage you to submit questions throughout the event. Please don't wait until the end to submit your questions, though. You can submit them as soon as you think of them by typing them into Zoom's questions box to the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, we are offering CLE today in Vermont and Pennsylvania. We are also pending approval in California for this event. Many states have reciprocity with those states, and we can send you a certificate of attendance if you registered for this event and if you fill out an additional form. Um, so I will be sending out the link to that form in the chat shortly. You must submit a code when filling out the form um, that basically just tells us you attended and we're paying attention. So the code is EJCLE322. I'll put it in the chat so um, you don't have to write it down right this moment, but it's EJCLE322. If you have any questions about CLE, you can email me at calhoun at eli.org. And with that, I will go ahead and introduce our moderator, Christine Perry. Christine is a staff attorney at ELI committed to advancing human rights in the environmental context with a particular focus on gender and disability. She works primarily on international issues with a focus on Latin America. Christine also works with ELI's Pro Bono Clearinghouse. Prior to joining ELI, Christine worked for Amnesty International, um, the International Secretariat's Law and Policy Program. Her work on international human rights focused on the rights of persons with disabilities, gender, policy development, and strategic litigation. Christine holds a JD from The Ohio State University Moritz College College of Law and a BA in Spanish and Creative Writing from Denison University. She's admitted to practice law in Ohio and is a member of the Global Network for Human Rights in the Environment. So I will turn things over to you, Christine. Um, and again, if you're seeking CLE, uh, look in the chat. I will be sending the links momentarily. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Madison. And again, thank you for our panelists and for our audience for being here. Before we jump into the panel, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the community lawyering series of which this webinar is a part of, and also a little bit about the pro bono clearinghouse at the Environmental Law Institute. So community lawyering, sometimes known as empowerment lawyering, is a key to meaningful environmental justice oriented pro bono work. Community lawyering involves collaborations with individuals and community members as facilitated partners, as a result, it differs from the more traditional representational lawyering, which many attorneys are familiar. And so this series on community lawyering is looking at practical nuts and bolts tools for attorneys to take on pro bono matters, environmental, pro, environmental justice pro bono matters, that this is the third in the series on conflict checks, and there will be more in the future, so please stay tuned that we hope you will join us as we expand this series. And this part of the series on conflict checks really came out of the pro bono clearinghouse and the need to address conflict checks, that the clearinghouse is was launched in February of this year. It's a tool for communities, individuals with pro bono matters that if their matter has been properly vetted by an attorney, that we can post the matter. And it's really for environmental law clinics, for legal nonprofits, other nonprofits who don't have the resources, capacity, or subject matter to take on these matters. And so we upload them to our clearinghouse, and the clearinghouse is open to ELI members, non-ELI members, that if you are admitted and in good standing and able to practice law, we really do encourage you to sign up for the Clearinghouse. We have some wonderful matters that are open, that are in need of help. And hopefully this webinar on conflict checks will demystify and make taking on these matters more accessible. 
And as Madison said, please feel free to throw any questions you have in the questions and answers box. I will be going and checking that throughout the program. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our wonderful panelists. And after each introduction, they're gonna give you a little bit more about them, about how they deal with conflicts in their own work. So let's start with Sabrina Ashjan. And Sabrina is a clinical supervising attorney at UC Berkeley's Environmental Law Clinic and a lecturer who teaches courses including environmental justice and advocacy in California and environmental justice and health equity. Prior to the position at UC Berkeley, she advanced animal welfare legislation as the California State Director of the Humane Society of the United States. She has nearly 15 years of legal experience, including as a public defender and consumer fraud and environmental protection prosecutor. She previously served as the chairperson of the state of California's Cannabis Control Appeals Panel after being appointed by Governor Brown. She received a bachelor's degree from George Washington University, a master's degree from University of Southern California's Anberg School for Journalism, and a JD and MBA from Pepperdine University. She is admitted to practice in law in California, New York, and the United States Supreme Court. We're so happy to have you here today, today Sabrina. Great, thank you so much, Christine. Um, welcome everybody, thank you for, all, for being here. Christine, would you like me to jump in now with regard to my presentation? Yes, why don't okay, you perfect. go through the deck? Okay. Great. All right. Wonderful. So thank you again um, for inviting me and including me in this panel. And thank you all for attending today. I really hope that, as Christine mentioned, this does demystify the process for all of you and uh, help you to feel comfortable and confident in taking on uh, these pro bono matters that are so critical for um, for these communities. So I just want to explain a little bit about the clinic process of how we take on cases and how we do our conflict check. And um, as Madison mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A box. I'm happy to answer them or uh, feel free to reach out to me after this panel. Uh, you can email me and I'd be happy to walk you through any of these steps. So for the clinic, um, I am part of the Environmental Law Clinic, but we operate as a holistic clinic with all of the other clinic programs at UC Berkeley, a school of law. So for instance, there's clinics in, I mean, really everything you can imagine, the death penalty clinic, human rights clinic, um, policy advocacy clinic. And so we operate as if we are one law firm. We share database information, we share personnel, we share office space, and so as a result, we treat ourselves as though we are one law firm. And so as such, we do our conflict check all together. So we admit students in the spring and the fall semesters. And after those students are admitted in the summer and the winter, we do the, this um, very thorough conflict check. So with our conflict check, we send a questionnaire to the students that asks them, Lots of relevant questions um, with regard to their prior work history, future work um, employment, as well as um, any sort of relationships they may have with any individuals who we would be working with. And we really try to get to the heart of some of the matters of the clinic projects that are on our fall or spring docket. Uh, so we ask students questions, really, I mean, all of the things you can probably imagine, but we ask them about whether they are uh, have worked in a state or federal court, and uh, if they have worked in a government agency at the local, state, or federal level, if they have worked at a law firm, if they have worked at um, an NGO, uh, if they've worked in-house or at a law firm. And so we ask them if they have done any of those things, if they can give a little bit of background and detail on some of the clients and representations and matters that they handled. Uh, we also ask them if they've worked in various regulatory agencies. And so we're constantly tweaking uh, the questionnaire to make sure that it's timely and relevant and addresses all of the cases that we're handling at a given time. If you have any ideas for things that we should be adding to it, we're happy to uh, take suggestions and do, do that. So 
basically the students have uh, a couple of days in which they fill out these questionnaires and then it's uploaded and we are all able to view it. And each clinic faculty, uh, each individual clinic chooses a faculty member that's going to oversee that process and go through all of the student responses to see if there are anything that raise any sort of red flags or that we'd like more information about. Um, for instance, if we find that a student has worked in a, a court that we're going to be working in or has worked uh, has worked in a regulatory agency that we have some cases with, we want to go through and check and ask them some, some further questions. So we'll do some follow up with them via email, via phone call. And uh, from there, we will determine if the case is cleared, if everything is fine, and uh, we can uh, move on with the process, or if we need to do some sort of remediation measures, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Um, and then we also do an internal process within our clinic just to make sure that uh, nothing has slipped by and that there are no projects that a student is going to be on where there would pose any conflict. And again, if there is, uh, we would assign that student to a different clinic project because we have multiple projects going at once. Uh, so if a conflict arises, usually it does not rise to the level of having a student not be able to participate in clinic programs. It usually is just a matter of maybe walling something off. Let's say that a person um, who wants to participate in the environmental law clinic prior to this did work um, uh, did work as a public defender. And so we might not, or, or as a prosecutor, so we might not want them to see what goes on with the death penalty clinic work. And so that those case files would be walled off or screened off from that student uh, and, and various other measures would be taken to make sure that that student does not have access to that material. Um, but generally, since this is uh, work that we are trying to do, um, social justice work on behalf of uh, you know, these critical clients, we really try to find a way to make sure that students can participate. Um, we don't wanna penalize students and not allow them to participate in the clinic. So we do um, figure out ways to, to wall them off and screen them off from other uh, clinics and other um, cases and processes. Uh, I just wanna also, if I have a few minutes, uh, just mention a couple of, uh, sort of red flags that I have seen that have come up that um, just to be aware of. So our clinic accepts non-law students. We take public policy students and um, sometimes business students or masters in public health students. And so they might not be familiar and aware of the same uh, clinic, um, or, I'm sorry, the same conflict and ethical duties as law students. And so we really need to be clear with them up front as to why we're asking these questions so that they do dig deep and give us all of those relevant answers. Um, so that's one, one flag that I would, I would mention if you are clinic practitioners out there. A second is that oftentimes students are getting jobs while this process is going on. For instance, they're going to also work or, you know, intern or extern for, for a semester. And so we have to make sure when we do start to meet as a as a clinic that um, they haven't obtained a job or a position within that time that might pose a conflict and if so have to fix that uh, and then the third is non-obvious conflicts so uh, last semester we were working on a project where we were doing some green infrastructure development and we were talking with um, we we're doing a policy paper and we were highlighting uh, an organization that is doing great work in this but it turns out one of the students actually was interning at that um, at, at that office. And she had no idea that that could be a conflict because she had no idea that we would even be talking to them or interviewing them. And so once we realized that, we assigned the student to a different project and it was quite easy to uh, remedy early on. And so it's just constantly being aware of those um, obvious conflicts, but also the non-obvious conflicts that might arise and how you might handle a situation planning in advance for how you would handle uh, moving a student around or making sure to screen off and any relevant matters. Um, but I really want to highlight the importance of doing this work and doing these cases. And uh, especially for the students, we really want the next generation of environmental practitioners and advocates and activists to get the hands-on training in order to do this work and to uh, work on behalf of these really um, 
really needed clientele. And so uh, anything that I can do after this to, to help you walk through the process, I would be happy to, because it, it really is such critical work. So thank you, Christine. And I look forward to hearing the other presentations from the other um, panelists and then answering any questions later on. Thank you so much, Sabrina. That was a really great look at how it's done in an academic setting in an environmental law clinic. And now we're going to have a look at more of the nonprofit side. Next, we are joined by Jeremy Orr. And Jeremy is the Director of Litigation and Advocacy Partnerships at Earth Justice. In this role, he helps Earth Justice's offices, programs, and departments build strategies to deeply engage and genuinely partner with communities and other stakeholders. Prior to joining Earth Justice, Jeremy served as a senior attorney with the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council, where he focused on drinking water and source water protection issues, working to ensure that all people have access to safe, sufficient, and affordable drinking water. Immediately before that, Jeremy worked for the People's Climate Movement as the director of state programs, building and mobilizing coalitions across more than 20 states in pursuit of climate justice. With a background in community organizing and community lawyering, Jeremy has also served as the Director of Organizing for Interfaith Worker Justice, an environmental justice attorney for the Transnational Environmental Law Clinic, the Executive Director of the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, and a lead community organizer with the Gamaliel, Gamaliel sorry, Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jeremy. Thank you, and, and, and thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I, I always enjoy kind of joining ELI, um, you know, either as a speaker or as a participant uh, in these webinars. So, uh, and this series of, has been great so far. So, so welcome, you know, again, to everyone who's uh, been able to join us today for this, uh, you know, important topic of, of conflict checks. Um, you know, as, as mentioned, I, I currently work in, uh, in the partnership realm, working with, with uh, our internal staff at Earth Justice to Kind of identify and, and, and help manage and, and maintain our, our community partnerships, which, as, as you could imagine, at a at an organization like Earth Justice, you know, a pretty large um, uh, environmental kind of law firm uh, that that we have a lot of staff and we have a lot of partnerships, um, and thus, you know, kind of a, a lot of clients across our um, you know offices and, and, and programs. So, um, you know, this 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 uh, process of conflict checks becomes. Uh, very critical, uh, in particular in this in this nonprofit space. As mentioned in the intro, uh, you know I, I you know currently work at Earth Justice, but you know spend time at at Natural Resources Defense Council and uh, local environmental law clinics, and and have run um, you know kind of hyper local environmental organizations. So it's kind of seen how uh, these conflicts uh, uh, checks and uh, have come up you know over the years at at varying levels. And what I'll talk about today is just kind of the 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 general process of of you know how Earth Justice has uh, handles conflicts and, and and kind of similarly how other kind of larger uh, bickering uh, organizations in particular with the legal aspect handles these kind of conflicts um, and then from there happy to uh, to answer any sort of uh, you know questions that may come up around this topic uh, so um, you know, I want to walk through how uh, we handle conflicts at an organization with kind of nearly uh, seven hundred people seven hundred staff many attorneys many who have worked. In different places before coming uh, to Earth Justice, um, and so that you know that the, um, so that you know becomes very critical when we when we do these conflicts. So, um, and I'll just start you from kind of how we begin uh, 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 to take a case when we're looking on taking on a, a a case before it actually turns into what we call a new matter and becomes a case we take on. So, um, you know, a, a preliminary conflict check, um, you know, is, is is generally run as as soon as our staff begin, you know, thinking about a potential matter or, or, or begin thinking about a client or have identified a potential client or partner, um, yeah, uh, you know, from, from across the spectrum of, of uh, organizations and agencies that we may partner partner with and, and may serve as clients for, for that work. Um, you know, it's, it, it's an essential step in, in protecting the organization from potential conflicts um, uh, in, in the work as it, as it moved forward. Uh, so, you know, it, it um, you know, those, those, those conflict checks then become, you know, kind of required uh, to be checked and cleared before any new matter um, can be assigned and, and, and board approved, right? So a lot of times our cases will go before uh, this conflict check, a, a new matter form is uh, submitted asking essentially for permission to, 
take on this case and then it goes to the board and our board of directors uh, approves that, right? And that's kind of the process of how it works and, and you know, proceeding that is this conflict check. So, um, you know, submitting these, these conflict checks, um, you know, request early kind of helps identify uh, and hopefully like resolve potential conflicts uh, pretty quickly. And, and it also helps kind of speed up this process of, uh, of assigning a matter number, what we call a matter number and moving this matter into, um, uh, you know, an official capacity for our staff to be able to work on it. Um, you know, we use uh, various organizations, right, kind of use various systems to kind of track this. Uh, you know, we, we use a particular system uh, with, with, within Earth Justice. Um, you know, it's kind of you go in, uh, into the system, you create uh, uh, what we call a, a, a create a new request, right? And, and um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty simple process. And it begins uh, a preliminary conflicts check for us. Um, you know, you, you'll be presented, right? Our staff will be presented with kind of a simple form that enters some kind of simple answers uh, to questions to kind of begin this process. And some of those preliminary uh, questions or information that's kind of required from our staff in this, this conflict check process is uh, kind of a one sentence description uh, of the matter itself. Um, you know, the, the, the name of, of the party in which, uh, you know, we're looking to, to, to partner with them and run this you know, particular client check on, um, you know, we identify what side uh, you know, that particular party will be on, uh, you know, whether it's, 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 it's plaintiffs or, or, or uh, defense. Uh, we also identify, uh, you know, the, the role of that party, um, uh, you know, per particularly, you know, in the matter as well. And then, um, you know, after that request is uh, submitted, you know, it'll be, um, you know, we call it, it'll, it'll be locked, right? So, so once you put it in, you, you can't, you know, go back and edit it. Uh, it then goes to our, you know, uh, litigation operations team. And, I, and I'll say, you know, right here uh, at, a, at an organization like Earth Justice, which is, which is pretty big, right? We have a general counsel's office and then within general counsel, uh, um, we, we have a, a team dedicated to simply doing these conflict checks, right? So, um, um, so that, you know, that in and of itself helps with this process significantly, um, you know, to be at an organization that has the resources to be able to uh, prioritize these conflict checks in a in a meaningful way. Um, so once this you know this preliminary conflict check is submitted, uh, you know it then goes to our our uh, litigation operations or lit ops as we call it to run a, a conflict check. Uh, and what they'll do, uh, you know, they'll reach out uh, directly if there are any potential conflicts identified. Um, or once it's clear, uh, you know, you would get a uh, an, an email or or some communication, uh, you know, saying that your you know your check is. Is clear, um, you know, and 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 after that's been approved, that you know, assuming it's been cleared, you know, you become aware of kind of, um, um, uh, you know, how to move forward with that. However, you know, if, if it uh, changes at any point, if it's approved and, and other um, other conflicts come up, additional parties are added, uh, you know, you can still kind of circle back, and you should be circling back to to update, um, you know, that process and make sure that you're doing these checks. Um, and as mentioned, you know, kind of once it's clear, uh, you know, you get an email and, and you can then turn it into a new matter and you can do that in a system. It gets converted into a, a, a formal new matter and then you can uh, go from there and begin the work of, of getting that conflict uh, approved up the chain and approved to, to work on. Now, in the instance that uh, there is, you know, potentially a conflict, we go through a, a, a process in which we would call like the clearing conflicts process. Um, you know, all new matters are, as mentioned, required to, to, to do this conflict check and be cleared before they can be assigned a, a new matter number and before our attorneys can begin working on it, uh, uh, you know, in earnest, um, you know, and, and that means confirming that, you know, none of our staff, you know, have potential conflicts related to their, uh, you know, to their prior work, uh, which is, you know, as you could imagine at a large organization with, you know, hundreds of, of uh, employees, a large nonprofit organization that you'll have, you know, individuals who may have worked in certain sectors and, and, and agencies and other nonprofits or corporations that you know could potentially pose a conflict so uh, in that space you know we, we 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 try to try to remedy that on the front end um, you know our, our 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 legal staff uh, you know kind of track all, all incoming you know legal staff prior clients and employers um, you know if if any uh, you know adverse party um, you know in a in a new matter or potential new matter you know matches one of these prior clients, then, uh, you know, that raises what we call a, a potential conflict flag. Um, you know, the staff is, is then asked to, you know, verify whether their former work or, you know, potentially 
uh, substantially, you know, will relate to this work of this new matter that 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 Earth Justice is looking to take take on. Um, you know, and and, and when a, a potential, you know, client is flagged, um, uh, in particular regarding a former client, the, you know, our our staff will, um, you know, will then send you, and this is our complex check staff will then send you an email um, asking for you to review uh, this this conflict that you flag containing, uh, you know, kind of information on the potential matter and how to move forward. Um, you know, you would then kind of, you would then, you know, open that email, you would click it and it would take you back to the system where you input this information on, on the, on the conflicts check and, and you would be prompted to answer uh, uh, some questions in particular at the most basic level. Uh, when you go back into the system, uh, you know, you click, um, you know, you're, you're given two, you're given a bunch of options, but you would click two of them. Uh, one is, you know, if there is no, no conflict or if there's a possible conflict, then that's for, uh, the attorney to input and then that information then goes back to our litigation operations department and um, uh, general counsel that, that does the conflict checks and um, if it's a possible conflict they then circle back and and and, and have further kind of more in-depth discussion around you know where those conflicts may lie uh, you know in in next steps um, and you know with that you know if, if you click that potential conflict it could you know, it could trigger a number of things, right? It could just be as simple as a, a quick screening with that litigation operations team to determine, okay, like you know, we're 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 in the we're in the clear. We're just you know, crossing our teeth and dotting our eyes, or uh, you may need to do. And this is something that we may talk about in, in uh, some of the uh, ensuing questions that come up. But you may do a waiver, um, or so on, or uh, you know, it may be an instance where uh, that conflict is imputed on the organization, and uh, you know, we just simply aren't able to work on. Uh, that organization uh, issue. So I'll I'll stop right there and, and look forward to, to answering uh, questions later. Thank you for that, Jeremy. I know I have some questions to follow up with you. So looking forward to that. And our last panelist is Laura Powell. Laura is a litigation associate at Fish and Richardson PC, where she focuses her practice on trial and appellate work relating to intellectual property. Laura currently serves as the co-chair of the Indigenous Land Subcommittee of the law firm Anti-Racism Alliance's Environmental Justice Working Group. Prior to joining Fish, Laura served as a judicial law clerk to the Honorable Evan J. Wallach of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit from 2018 to 2020, a and a judicial law clerk to the Honorable Gregory M. Sleet of the U.S. District Court for the District of Delaware from 2017 to 2018. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. Thank you. And um, thank you all for having me to today. And thank you to Sabrina and Jeremy for pro providing insight into your organizations. Um, like Christine said, I'm primarily an, an IP attorney, but I focus my pro bono on EJ issues, um, specifically related to indigenous lands. I'll touch on a couple of additional points that are specific to firms. Um, a lot of what Sabrina and Jeremy said is very similar to how conflicts work for us, except we're getting our cases from like clearing houses and clinics and organizations that you all, you the other panelists work at when they can't take a case. Um, so I'm gonna, speak on a couple of additional points specific to the firms and starting with working with your pro, pro bono team, starting conflicts and the importance of defining boundaries of the relationship and the importance of partnering with other firms. Um, my, first, my first thing that I wanna discuss is speaking, working with your pro bono team. Conflicts start the second we see a potential client or um, matter come in. And we have, we have since we have to protect the many clients that firms represent, and we're, I'm not even aware of all of the clients we represent. Um, it's it's very important to work with the pro bono committees. These folks have been an, an invaluable resource to me and my colleagues when we're bringing in cases. They um, they have they work on the conflicts before we even speak to potential clients, since most of the information and most of the cases coming in are pressing. They also like help us figure out ways to make our work possible. So to start our complex checks, we have to send a description of the project to our pro bono committee and the firm. 
we've learned when running conflicts on these EJ issues um, by trial and error, that it's very important for us to figure out exactly what each project entails. Sometimes there are more than one issue in a case that come in and we may only be able to help with like one aspect of that case, um, which is why it's so important to explain upfront um, what like for us to know upfront what the project, like what the contours of it are and letting, if we've made contact with the organizations, we need to let them know upfront that we are either requesting additional information so we can clear conflicts or explain that we can't take the case yet for a certain, like basically a non, we can't tell them what reason, but like we can tell them we're still running conflicts and it hasn't gone through yet. Um, these conflicts get pretty tricky sometimes. So I've found that given the number of companies and clients, we when we can't take on maybe like a full matter, like a full litigation matter because we might have an adverse client within our firm, we can sometimes help for a limited purpose. So we might be able to help with a research memo that's urgent or help make comments on something that the client is doing. Um, if we can take on the full great case, which we have in some circumstances, that's great. Um, and I, I wanna touch my third point on my third point, which is the importance of partnering with other firms. I'm currently working on a case that we were able to, where we were able to take on the full matter. Um, like I, like, like it was mentioned, I'm an intellectual property attorney. So we don't have like the extensive list of environmental clients that a lot of the big firms do. Um, but because I'm an IP attorney, I don't necessarily know everything in land, water, EJ more generally. So it's important for us to recognize that initially and find someone who does understand that. And it, so one way we've done that is we've partnered with other law firms who otherwise wouldn't be able to work on the case, um, but they can come in and advise or work on specific issues. So they can advise on the law and tell us what we can and can't do as co-counsel, but they, may only be able to do that in certain aspects of the case. So like, while well, we can potentially handle any litigation that comes up and they can't, they can help us figure out what exactly we need to be looking at, how the issues work and sort of act as like, obviously co-counsel, but act as like a teacher in a way to us as we're learning something. Um, so, and that, that helps both the clients getting their uh, matters handled and it helps both like us when we're trying to learn a new area of the law and it allows the other firm to put in resources and help out on something that they really have an interest in as well. Um, so I'll say when we're talking, like the practice tip that I wanna give you is just like work with your pro bono teams because they know exactly how conflicts work within your firm. And then like make sure that you're getting the information that you need from the organizations you're getting these cases from and get that information early and upfront. And if you have to reach out to a potential client, make sure that they know that you're not representing them yet, but you're interested in learning more about the case. Um, that way, even if like you end up being conflicted out of it, you might be able to rep like send that client's information to another law firm who can take the case. And I, with that, Christine, I think that uh, covers how we work in the law firm context with all of you guys. And thank you for the clearinghouse. It's been really beneficial to us. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, Jeremy and Sabrina for those introductions. I think that gave a really nice overview. Um, again, if you have questions for the panel, please submit them. But I'm going to kick us off with some questions of my own. And since this is a series on community lawyering, I do wanna to touch on the ways you interact with potential clients, what type of information you give them during this process, when is the client relationship formed or defined, and keeping in mind that you're maybe working with someone who doesn't have a lot of experience working with lawyers, working with the law. So they might think, great, this lawyer's talking to me, this is my lawyer. 
So how do you help define those boundaries and that relationship during this process? I can start it off from the law firm perspective. Um, so most of the time when we're getting the cases from as law firms, they're coming in sort of pre-vetted, um, which like the clearinghouse sort of, I, the clearinghouse does this and it's really nice because we already have all the information that we need to run our conflict. So if we're reaching out to a client, it's because we've cleared or we've like, we only need one additional thing to clear conflicts. Um, so from our perspective, it's actually probably easier than the other two perspectives, <laughs> but um, our, our relationship at that point then starts when we talk to the client or reach out to the client. Um, it starts when we reach out to the client, but definitely when we talk to them. Jeremy, would you like me to jump in or do you want to go first? Okay, great. All right. So I thought that was a, a fantastic point, Laura, that you mentioned uh, in your opening about uh, making sure to really go over the scope um, and the parameters and, and boundaries of, of a relationship. And I think that starts at the beginning with when we do the initial reach out to, uh, we will reach out to a number of different potential clients um, and, and then choose from that the couple of projects that we're going to be able to work on. Uh, we need to get a lot of information as to, um, you know, what is involved. Is it something that can be handled in a semester or a couple of semesters for students' participation? And so we really try to make it very clear to the potential clients that we are not representing them yet, that we are really just trying to have this initial conversation and trying to see if it's something that we can represent them. And if it's not something where we can represent them, you know, we will try to provide them with some resources of other avenues that they can take. Um, but I think that having those really uh, very honest conversations and, and being very forthcoming about that information really early on is the first step in all of this process, which is, is super helpful of, of just really defining the scope and the boundaries. Because even if we do take on a client matter, we're only handling um, in, in our instances, you know, a very small um, issue compared to all of the issues that a, a client or a community might be facing. And so we really want to be clear on that. Um, so that was a really good sort of practice tip to also keep in mind. And I'll hand it over to Jeremy. Yeah, I, I think, you know, just reiterating with with both said, like, like setting those boundaries um, and setting expectations early on in the process of communication with potential clients. And, and as you can imagine, either at a firm or, or, or at a law clinic or at a kind of big nonprofit law firm, uh, you get a lot of people reaching out to you too as well, right? Like not just, you know, us kind of reaching out to them to kind of help develop a case or we may see an environmental issue come up and we're looking for a, a good client to, to partner with to address this, this issue. But a lot of times you'll get, you know, random emails and, and random phone calls from, from community members who have very real issues and are looking uh, for support or to be pointing in the right direction, right? And oftentimes that can be interpreted as, okay, this person responded to my email or responded to my phone call, they must be looking to represent me or they must be representing me at this point. So I think it's so critical to, to kind of set clarity on the front end that, you know, these are kind of exploratory conversations uh, as well. And I know for us, you know, at, at EarthDust, I'd imagine, you know, kind of with you all too, at, at some point, uh, you know, you, you then, you know, move to a, a kind of a, a formal client agreement and retainer agreements come into play where you have very clear understandings, right, of, of what the roles and responsibilities are. Um, but even before then, right, I think, you know, that it's, it's very clear sometimes that attorney-client relationship can be established um, for people without even recognizing it, and, you know, it, it, unless or until those, those kind of boundaries are set and those expectations are set. But, yeah. Thank you. And then, oh, yes, go ahead, Sabrina. I will just say the the retainer agreement also getting that um, getting that done very early on so that you can just have in writing you know what the scope is of the representation the type of the representation what pro bono means what the time you know length is of of the representation is also really critical so thanks for bringing that up Jeremy and sorry Christine go ahead 
No, that was great. Thank you um, for adding that. I think that is really important to keep in mind, you know, defining when the relationship starts, but then defining what is the relationship because that's critical because they might think, oh, you're doing everything for me. When in reality, you can only do parts one through three and then four through 12, you can't. And so kind of looking at this relationship with the potential client, I want to talk more about if there is a potential conflict. I know that all three of you touched upon it, talking about screening someone, walling someone off within the firm, the nonprofit. I'm going to refer to the clinic as a firm because it's set up as a quasi firm. So looking at that, what next steps do you determine when you can say, okay, you know, someone in the clinic, someone in the firm has a conflict, but it doesn't rise to the level where we are all conflicted out. So how do you help determine those kind of gray areas? So from the firm's perspective, um, I, I work very closely with our pro bono committee because they're the ones who handle the majority of our conflicts. Um, so grateful for them. <laughs> But they, like they've, they've, we haven't really run into that issue given that I'm in IP and I focus on um, like my pro bono on EJ work. But I think that if I had IP work, I would see that as pro bono come up more. Um, but what the, what our co-counsel in one case said is she had to go through and specifically define what their firm could look at and touch in their um in the matter that we're working on together and they had to we had to basically define an agreement between co-counsel and an agreement between um the other firm and the client so we ended up having to add in an additional um layer of agreements to ensure that all like liabilities and all um responsibilities were defined i'm not sure if that answered your question but that's the only way i've really seen um conflicts actually be an issue so far. No, I think that's helpful that you do have to build in those extra layers of protection, just, you know, for yourself, for your firm, and for the client. I mean, that this is to protect them, that, you know, you don't want something down the road where you do a wonderful job for them, and then the other side goes, wait, this was inappropriate. So it really is important. Yeah, and I, I add one last thing on that is you can get, it's very easy working in a firm to get um, very enthusiastic about the work you're doing. So it's important to like continuously check yourself and make sure that you're doing um, what's defined in the agreement because we all want to do um, work that's help actually helping people. And um, we, we do have to check ourselves <laughs> occasionally to make sure we're still within the bounds of the agreement. And if we aren't, we go back to the committee and try to expand on that, um, um, expand on our representation, which is always another option. I don't know, Sabrina or Jeremy, if you want to jump in there. Jeremy, I'll let you go first this time. Yeah, you know, I, um, you know, I think. Uh, uh, a couple of things in that regard in terms of like the like identifying um you know the staff and, and certain particular information that that kind of helps you like on the front end uh you know I, I think you know again kind of working at a at a larger organization you'll get staff who, who come from all over right you 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 get staff who have worked in various different sectors and and are now here and, and are looking to work on you know particular issues so uh, you know, as you can imagine, uh, these issues come up. The the, the two that kind of typically kind of stand out where this, um, you know, would 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 be most relevant is is you know, um, you know, staff members who have maybe worked at a government agency, right? Which which is pretty common to go between government agencies and kind of nonprofit sector work. Uh, and then you have clients who have worked at corporations, right? Which which I would say we we probably don't get as much on our staff, right? Clients who have worked in, in for the oil and gas industry and then come in to, to work on the advocacy side, that, that's not as common, uh, but that's you know, one where you could, you could see that conflict uh, you know, popping up because oftentimes we're taking on private polluters, but the government agency one that, that feels like it happens is, is very real, especially at big green organizations who uh, kind of sift between um, you know, 
you know, staff members who may have worked at an agency and now we're, we may be challenging that agency on a, on a, on a legal issue, on a rule or, or, or something like that. I think the, you know, those conversations that take place uh, necessarily, you know, have to be related to, you know, the, the, the substance of their work uh, during their time at that organization or a corporation or agency, um, you know, the, the extent of that work. And then you look at the extent of, of um, the, the, the project that we're looking to take on or the, or the matter that we're looking to take on, right? And, and, the, and, and is there some correlation or, or um, you know, direct tie to that person's time there? Uh, and, and, and is that significant enough to, uh, you know, impute on the whole organization or is this something where we can say, okay, which, you know, I've seen before, we can say, okay, this person in this department at the organization, will, you know, will, will not be allowed to, to, to work on on this and, and can we ship that to a completely different team or, or different department kind of wall that off? But I think a, a significant part of that kind of early on check is, is looking at the substance of that person, the time and substance of that person's work at that organization and just kind of the direct relation to what the, the new matter might be. Thank you for that. Sabrina, I don't know if you wanna add something. Sure, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Jeremy and Laura just mentioned. Um, with the clinic, it's it's um, often easier, at least with from the student perspective, than uh, I would imagine it, it is for, for Jeremy or Laura, because the students have not had so many experiences. You know, they have uh, each had uh, probably a few years of experience or a couple of summers of experience, um, but they're usually at the more high level. So even if they have worked in an agency or, or you know, been in a in a um, certain court or local government agency or something of that nature, usually doesn't rise to the level where the matters that they touched uh, would uh, would prevent us from handling a case. Um, completely. Um, but often we do have to have those additional conversations just to make sure, especially for those students who have had a significant amount of work experience, obviously those, those students do exist. And so we do want to make sure that we're asking really relevant, in-depth, um, detailed questions. Uh, but for the most part, we have been able to, as I think Jeremy and Laura also just mentioned, have been able to sort of wall off or have, you know, a specific clinic not see the um, work going on from another clinic, um, more so than having to uh, decline certain cases, uh, at least for our purposes, although I could see for the law firm and for a big green organization that there are cases that you maybe just cannot take because of it, but, um, but for the clinic, uh, I will let everybody know that you probably can take the case and there's probably ways to do it. And we can we can talk about that offline also. Thank you. And all three of you touched upon really who the go-to person is in your organization that Laura said, you know, the pro bono coordinator. Jeremy has a litigation operation team doing it. And Sabrina, you mentioned that it's a faculty member from each of the various clinics going through and doing this. And it does seem like an intensive process. Are there softwares that you use to help aid you in this or is it really just person power getting through these um, conflict checks and digging deep into the information? Well, I'll go first because it's probably the easiest uh, because it's the smallest amount. Uh, so ours is just um, people powered, uh, you know, through our uh, through our legal assistants that end up compiling the information. But I have worked in government agencies where we have utilized, uh, you know, software programs to do this, on, uh, especially when I was at the public defender's office, you know, we had to be very cognizant of um, just, just so many individuals that we were representing to make sure that um, we were not violating anyone's rights or sharing any information on cases that, that could be um, conflicting. Um, so there are software programs available in this space um, that I am sure the bigger organizations are utilizing. Yeah, I think that's right. As as mentioned, uh, at, at least with some of the larger kind of nonprofit organizations I've worked at, there's you know kind of software utilized. I mentioned you know we utilize the software at Earth Justice that's kind of automated, right? You can you can put it in and it, and it can run these conflict checks um, automatically, right? It'll flag it for you. And then of course uh, somebody, as mentioned, right? We have a, a general counsel's office and the litigation operations team uh, that has people assigned specifically uh, to review these conflicts. So. 
uh, that that certainly makes it uh, much easier to kind of kind of track and log. And, and of course, you know, our attorneys are required to input this information, update it when things change. So it really is a, a whole system in place that's, uh, you know, meant to protect the, the organization and, and, and meant to protect the staff from being conflicted out or um, as somebody mentioned earlier, right, having this issue come up when you're down the line in the litigation and, and you know, the opposing party looks up and they can flag something about you and, and, and kind of gets you kicked from the case. I mean, that it matters to, 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 to have some systems in place to, to check this on the front end. We, we operate very similar, Jeremy. Um, and I think I'm just a little... I'm a little lucky in the fact that my our when I say our pro bono coordinator is wonderful, she handles all of this for us. So um, she goes to the people who we might need to get like a waiver from or something like that. But we I haven't seen it come up in the EJ context yet. So thank you. And I'd like to go back to something that Laura you discussed working with other firms that might be conflicted out who can give advice, but I think that this type of pro bono work, environmental justice work, that it really takes a village, that you might need an expert, a non-legal expert from one field and really work with a variety of actors to help bring a case. And so I'm wondering what type of arrangements do you have with both legal and non-legal experts that you might need to bring into a case and how that relates to conflict checks? Yeah, so we can actually bring in, in addition to like legal experts we, who go through the full conflicts process, we've brought in um, consultants for parts of our cases, um, whether they're legal or non-legal consultants. And we just go through the same process and get an, get an agreement in place to ensure that they can work on the case. And it's basically them attesting to they have no adverse conflicts for a client as well. Um, the EJ client that we're representing. And it's it's a really, it's, it's actually been a really great process. Um, I think it's really good for the both the clients and the attorneys across the board to be able to hear from these experts and consultants. Um, but it's, it's relatively easy. We're, we just get an agreement in place. Um, and like from the law firm perspective, like they have we have them pretty like in a place where we can just like find a standard agreement and if we need to modify it we just modify it and then run it through the higher ups at the firm who need to see all of these types of agreements thank you for that i don't know jeremy or sabrina if you have anything to add i imagine it might be similar at your types of organizations as well Yeah, it's similar. I have nothing else to add on this one. Same, same. That's that's what I thought, but I think it's good to um, just hear about all the different kinds of angles. And then looking at this, you know, that I know that you have the various teams in place, the various program software, but how long does it usually take to run a conflict on a matter? I can start and just say it depends on the who we're trying to represent. Um, it's very potential client dependent. <laughs> um, so it, that's why it's so important to start early. Like if you think like when I'm getting the, when I get EJ cases and try to bring them into my firm, I know that there's people at other firms, like probably four or five different firms running the same conflicts and I'm in communication with those attorneys. And I'm like, have you gotten through? And I'll get an email back that says no. Um, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna reach out to our committee again and see where we are in the process. So like staying persistent can help push, seems to, I don't know if it actually is a reason that conflicts sometimes push through, but I found that being persistent um, has like made it pretty quick to get through. But when I say quick, I'm talking like, a, between like a week to like a month. It's not, it's not a very fast process. <laughs> so it's not, I mean, and even with the clearinghouse that we might have someone say, hey, we need help by Wednesday and we get it on Monday and we have to say, you know, this, we can post it, but realistically, you're probably not going to be able to get someone to come onto the clearinghouse, look at it, run all of the steps they need to do 
and then be able to take it. So I think there is a really important step of setting the expectations for time because in the legal world, yeah, things take longer. Yeah. I think that's a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Laura. No, go ahead, Sabrina. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I think that's also um, a lesson that I try to just do some proactive outreach with a lot of the communities who I have worked with a lot about the lead time that's needed for all of these, because I think that oftentimes they will say like, oh, this appeal is due in 30 days, you know, can your clinic handle it? Or, you know, can you point me in the direction of someone that can, uh, you know, and I will just try to point out to these different community groups, the importance of uh, you know, trying to share that information with us before it's even, you know, when it's just an idea that is coming, they know the general plan is going to change in their community, or they know that um, that there is going to be some sort of uh, fight over a, a polluting site that's in, in a community or something of that nature to just sort of have those conversations really early on with potential um, uh, you know, organizations that can represent them because that is too short of a lead time. And, you know, somebody can think, well, oh, you could write a brief in, you know, 30 days, but it's all of this process that we're discussing today that is what holds them up and holds people up who want to help and want to do the work, but just are, are unable to because it would prejudice the case. It would, you know, affect others who we have worked for and with. And so just really trying to share that message as often as possible with those community groups, I think is really important. And it can be really difficult because some of these are just so urgent that there isn't, you know, that some cases that, you know, they're gonna take a long time and they've been lasting for years, but other cases that it, there's an immediacy that it makes it really difficult having these wait times to go through the proper steps. Well, and one, one thing that we encountered recently was um, we thought that something was going to be more long term. So we, we thought that we had more time on conflicts. And then it turned out that like a deadline was three weeks away. So we ended up running a separate conflicts check on just the limited purpose of doing like a small research memo on a certain statute. Just so like if it got through, we could help the clients. We ended up having like five days to write this memo and advise um, the EJ clients. And it was a long five days, but it, it worked out. <laughs> yeah, I, I think going going back to that piece of a sense of urgency, I know we have you know kind of a process in place in which like if, if there is a sense of urgency to to not bypass the conflicts process, right? But but normally, as I mentioned, right, the first step in kind of a new matter is is the conflict checks and then. You know, but if you have enough information, in particular, if you're thinking of recurring clients that you may normally take on, uh, that may be other big green organizations or so on, um, you know, the process in which you can expedite and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to issue the new matter form and begin the work. Um, and then the conflicts check would still be run while you're concurrently working on it. That's, that's kind of a, a process that, you know, uh, we may use, I've seen used in, in kind of other organizations when there's a sense of urgency. Um, but you know the, the the important part is to remember that there's still a conflict check happening. It just isn't you know holding you up from moving forward if you reasonably you know realize that you have enough information and there there most likely is a conflict. So. And then one more thing I'll say with um, with regard to the clinic specifically, and I'm sure that this happens at other. All, all the other schools that have clinics as well, but we have a uh, student slip projects, which are student led pro bono projects. And um, they're in so many different areas. And uh, this might be something also we can connect with about the clearinghouse, but they are overseen by um, second or third year students who have worked on that pro bono project previously. And so they have the knowledge and experience and there's a faculty advisor who observes and uh, helps out. And they can often do a lot of the work on, on things that are advice or memos or uh, interviews or, or things like that. And, and so we will often say, if it's something that the clinics can't handle, you know, please reach out to our SLIPS program because there are students who are ready and willing to do pro bono work who probably don't have those same sort of conflicts arise because it's just a very small group and a very small group who have, uh, you know, more limited uh, backgrounds and experiences. And so that also might be a great idea for some of these 
clearinghouse projects that we can talk about at another time. But I would assume that all of the schools have uh, various programs like that. That's really great to know that we, we will definitely talk about that offline. Um, Another question I have is about waiving conflicts. Do clients ever waive conflicts? What does that look like? I haven't seen it done in the EJ context, but I've seen instances where clients are, are willing to waive and I, they have to sign a waiver, both, both clients do. Yeah, I've, 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 I've seen it used in, um, in a few different capacities in particular. Um, I think where I see it, um, you know, maybe come up most often, right, a, a kind of across organizations that I've been at is, is, is where you have multiple clients in particular, right? Um, kind of maybe two instances, one where you have uh, clients where, where you've already maybe even even began litigation or maybe in, in the process of and uh, you realize that there are, are there are diverging goals of those clients, right? And and and, and I can see that come up, you know, fairly often when you have diverging goals of of maybe of, of maybe you know particular frontline communities and maybe a conservation group or something like that, right? Um, so I think there you you have that instance. And the other piece too I've seen is where you have um, you know potentially me like membership based organizations that that um, you know you may have a large national organization and a state level organization and then a, a local organization where you may have, you know, clientele with 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 any number of those on 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 any number of issues, and and sometimes even those those issues tend to be conflicting, right? So oftentimes having a, a um, you know, uh, one of those organizations, you know, doing that that conflict waiver to say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm I'm fine with you representing our you know our our membership organization on this issue that we otherwise may not you know be on the same page about. Yeah, I think uh, in my previous practice, the areas where I saw it most often were like Jeremy just mentioned, where it's diverging interests of, um, you know, some of these, you know, a national organization with the local or, um, or, uh, you know, e even if it's two community groups, um, but they, that you think are aligned, but then start to have diverging perspectives based upon a lot of the, like, environmental health versus uh, conservation or land use uh, issues and, and things of that nature, but I haven't experienced it with uh, the clinic necessarily. And so I know we've been talking about conflicts and that they can be complicated. They can be, you know, maybe a little mysterious before getting into this pro bono work, but I really do want to highlight some of the work that you're doing in the environmental justice sector and what this means to you, what this means to the clients you're representing, and maybe some positive and good experiences that you've had that you can share with me and our audience. So I can start. Um, I love what I do outside of pro bono, but um, it's it's such a moving experience to get to work with um, tribes. My, it's, it's a helping, helping tribes um, with their various needs has been, I like, I don't even know the words to express this, but it's just been such a, a moving um, experience for everyone on my team. I've seen, we have a team of eight attorneys working on one case right now and we are all so like we'll drop, we we'll stay up late later than we would want to to um, make sure that something is done right, and we'll make sure that the work is good of good quality. And we go back and forth on it. We work with um, our our partners and to see the clients that like sit there across Zoom or um, in person and just tell you thank you for listening and thank you for taking the time to hear what we have to do, have, like what our needs are and what we're trying to get across. The fact that they, they don't need to say that, but the fact that they do is just like, it, it motivates us even more to make sure that we're doing um, 
the best job that we can. And it's, I think everyone who is involved in the case that I'm thinking of particularly is grateful that not only that we can represent them, but that they're willing to let us represent them. And Laura, I'm gonna fall, before I um, let Jeremy and Sabrina go, I'm gonna ask a follow-up since you are at a firm and it is a different setup than Sabrina and Jeremy have. I mean, is this something that firms are open to that this type of pro bono work because you do hear the, well, the conflicts, the conflicts, but it seems like it's been a really great experience. And I hear that from so many other people at different firms saying it's totally worth it. Oh yeah, it's been completely positive. Um, it turns out that there had been a number of people that wanted to do EJ work at my firm and they just didn't know how to get it. We didn't know where to get training. So our um, pro bono coordinator, when I came to her with a couple projects, we, um, we discussed pretty in depth, like where we could find um, advice and training. So that's how we ended up partnering with another firm. And that's how we found ELI. And ELI has been like one of the best resources to us. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's doable. It's completely doable. I'd say it's, you know, I think it was easier than bringing, getting through the conflicts was a little bit easier than like some of our non pro bono work getting through. Um, it definitely got through fast, gets through. Like the case that I'm thinking of definitely got through faster, but yeah, it's doable. It's the, the hardest part is really figuring out what the needs of the individuals are and like what the timelines are. So like, if you can figure that out, like that's the hardest part. And it's really good for like learning client relations. Um, it's, I, I would advocate for the fact that you get really good experience as an associate working on these matters and working with clients and running like teams. Um, for example, my team has two partners on it who work with us, but they, I get me and the other associates get to run all the calls with the clients. And it's, it's a great experience to get to do that. And it's really translated over into like my billable work. Um, and it's helped me there. So I'd say if anyone is at a firm and they're trying to figure out whether it's worth it, the answer is a hundred percent yes. <laughs> Thank you. Jeremy or Sabrina, who would like to go next? Yeah, I can I can jump in. I you know I, I think the work's been, you know I, I, I mentioned my role at, at Earth Justice is partnerships, right? So so uh, I have you know haven't spent years kind of in a senior attorney role over the years working directly on these issues with clients. I'm I'm kind of a, a, a one degrees removed now, right? So my role is to support our staff uh, in building up their kind of uh, competencies and skill sets to engage. Uh, partners and clients, right, and new ones, and, man, and maintaining uh, those those existing relationships, and uh, you know, it's 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 been you know really enjoyable to do that. In particular, when you know we hear from staff or I, or, or my team hears from uh, you know clients of, of, around just just how great that relationship has been. Uh, you know, I think of, of one instance in particular um, with uh, you know someone on our on our energy team. They were looking to. to to uh, comment on a on, on an energy transmission issue at the federal level, and and we had kind of sat down and worked through you know what communities are most impacted by it, and, and, and which you know type of partner and type of client would would, would be best to to represent, and and um, you know trying to identify an environmental justice group, and and we were able to identify a, a local uh, NAACP chapter uh, that was in a community that would be directly impact, impacted by these these energy uh, transmission issues and reform and. Uh, you know, we're able to work with them and build that relationship and ultimately, you know, get a retainer agreement and represent them. Uh, and then, you know, maybe about a, a couple of weeks ago, I heard back, you know, directly from that, you know, from that NAACP chapter just saying, you know, thanks so much for connecting us. You know, the the the, the attorneys you connected us with were great. Um, you know, they were awesome. I'd, you know, love to keep you all in mind and, and work with you again on, on, on other issues that may come up. And this was, uh, you know, a new partner and a new client that had never worked with our organization before right at the, at the local level and um and that's just like gratifying right to know that okay like like we're in a position to really help in a meaningful way um especially with ej communities and impacted communities and 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 serve as uh you know uh you know solid good legal counsel in their issues so 
Yes, I would just uh, agree wholeheartedly with what Laura and Jeremy said that uh, the conflict process is really a, a simple one. Uh, you know, it does take time and steps, just like, you know, everything that we do. But I really ho do hope that this encourages everyone out there to take on these cases because these are often the most marginalized, vulnerable communities who don't have other places to turn for help and uh hear no all the time in terms of, um, you know, getting representation and getting access and getting assistance and um, just being able to provide them with real help that is going to impact their lives, impact their health, impact their futures, impact their communities is so gratifying. And from a clinic perspective, it's just uh, tenfold gratifying to get to see the students experience this and to have them realize the difference that they can make in people's lives because in law school it's just so theoretical and so so much is detached from why the students went to law school in the first place so really getting them on the ground getting them uh, with these clients getting them in these communities and seeing the change that they really have the agency to make uh, I think is so critical just for our profession also. And so, um, you know, we, ju we just really highly recommend uh, participating in these projects, taking the time and the steps and the preparation that's involved, you know, from a clinic faculty member to, you know, do the, think about this strategically, you know, what clients we can take on and how to make this process work and, and do all of that prep work because it's so meaningful um, and makes such a difference, so wholeheartedly uh, support this work. Thank you. And Sabrina, I have a follow-up question. Since you do work with students, do you think that they carry this through in their careers, that since they've done this type of pro bono work at the clinic level, that they're going to bring that to the firms they go to or wherever they go next? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, so I meet with all of my students a, a lot of times throughout the semester and then after the semester to talk with them about you know their career goals and aspirations and a lot of them sort of um, will maybe often sheepishly say to me that they are going to go work at a law firm you know and I want them to take you know the skills and the experiences that they had in the clinic or uh, you know with the the representation that we were able to do and utilize that in in their um, practice areas you know I think that it just makes for better lawyers, as Laura mentioned, just having the access and the ability to have done these interviews, have done these, uh, you know, client communications, have, have thought about these issues in a really holistic manner, I think is really helpful for whatever practice area people go into. And then also, I think that it, it um, shows them the importance of giving back and paying it forward and participating in pro bono. And they can be the ones that go to their law firms, like it sounds like Laura did, and say, these are really righteous issues and cases, and there's a way to make it work and be, you know, beneficial and really improve the morale, improve the, um, you know, improve the skill set of the attorneys involved, improve, you know, our our um, relationships with the community. And so, uh, I do think that those students will be the ones that go and advocate within their own firms to do these pro bono projects. And so I think that's also a huge component because a lot of the students are going to go to uh, into private practice, into law firms, and we want them to uh, you know, talk about the importance of pro bono work and really know how to actually implement the pro bono work, which they're, you know, they have the skills to do from doing these cases in a setting where they can be monitored. Sabrina, just to follow up on that, I had a 1L summer associate and a 2L summer associate working on my EJ case this summer. Um, my firm likes to provide um, all summers the ability to work on pro bono cases. Um, and they were fan like the 2L summer who had been working on um, in a clinic her 2L year, fantastic. The 1L summer was so enthusiastic and he like did a phenomenal job as well. But like to see that law students are like, they were they were very excited to work on something that was out of their comfort zone. And just like, that was actually like, they felt was meaningful. So that's, it was, it was cool. Oh, I love hearing that they were able to, in their summer, be able to participate in that. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so those great pro bono coordinators at my firm are, they're really good. <laughs> yeah. 
I'd like to remind the audience that we just have a few more minutes. So if you have a question, please um, put it in the Q&A. We will ask our fabulous panelists. And I would ask, do you have any advice or tips, something maybe we didn't cover that you'd like to add or something you'd like to reiterate from what you said that's important for our audience to think about when dealing with conflicts and when maybe approaching this type of work? I'll say as an associate at a firm, don't be afraid to learn about the conflicts process. Um, it's scary at first, but it's not that scary once you learn what you're, what's going on. Um, and just realize that like you can actually bring in this type of work as an associate. So don't don't let the fact that you're not more senior um, turn you away from taking on these types of cases. Jeremy, do you want to go ahead or tell me to? Uh, you, you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, I think I'll just reiterate, uh, you know, what I was just so um, saying in such an impassioned way, but really that uh, this work is so critical and so important. And uh, the, the communities and the clients that have this need really is so great and really is to them life and death because it's their health, it's their community, it's their jobs, it's their livelihood, it's um, their children's health and futures. And so it's so critical that we work on these cases uh, in, in these EJ communities and for the most marginalized that uh, I just really encourage everyone that the conflict process is, is so minor and, you know, compared to everything that we have to do in the law, it's, you know, just one more step in following rules and, uh, you know, understanding how to, how to figure out a process, which we're all very familiar with doing. Um, but the, the benefits and, and the rewards are so great and just will have such ripple effects in these communities that we're able to do this work in. And so um, I, I cannot stress enough how important this work is and how, uh, if anybody has any issues or they wanna walk through anything afterwards, I'd be happy to, to help. Yeah, and I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll keep it short and say, you know, as, as I mentioned, right, the, the conflicts process, you know, it sounds like it can be intimidating, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's worthwhile, oftentimes not that difficult. And I think the thing to keep in mind is that it really is a place to protect you, protect your organization and protect your client. And that's the thing I think that's that's really important to kind of center in that. Um, it's, it's meant to make sure that you do have a smooth process in representing clients, uh, you know, in your matters and in your cases. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's totally worth learning and, and better understanding um, in order to kind of engage in, in these types of cases. So. And it does look like we have a question. So I think this is something that you touched upon briefly, Jeremy, but for community lawyering, for lawyers with community lawyering experience, has anyone had a conflict with two different community groups? So neighborhood groups that maybe have different perspectives on the same issue. Yeah, I mean, I think it, 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 it comes up fairly often right but i think sometimes there's a you know there's a difference between uh di diverging you know views outside of litigation right and and diverging views once like a case or a matter has actually started where it's much more consequential uh where you know oftentimes we're working towards a, a, a remedy that that's laid out in a complaint right and and um you know, for, for, you know, uh, organizations to who, who may be, you know, representing multiple clients or organizations to then um, at some point determine they, but like maybe they want different things. I, I think that's very difficult to, to handle. I think it's, it's particularly, particularly this comes up in community groups because the remedy may be different when we work with EJ organizations, right? Like some communities may uh, want a, 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 a particular result, what they, they, they may want, you know, a facility shut down or they, they, they may want some sort of community benefits agreement or something like that, where other organizations may want a different type of, of compensation or a different type of remedy, and uh, they diverge. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen instances where uh, sometimes it's, it's been able to kind of reconcile that and, and, and work towards the same goal. Uh, other instances I've seen where, uh, a, you know, a, attorneys may have to, you know, conflict themselves out, right, or somebody may have to, to, to step out of, of that particular uh, case to get, you know, to, to allow it to, to move forward. So, 
uh, it does happen. Um, you know, it happens in the litigation um, venue as well. But I, I feel like I've seen it more often than not, um, either pre right during these during these conflicts, kind of check period before you take it on, or um, um, kind of in a in a non litigation capacity. Thank you for that, Sabrina. Laura, I'm not sure if you want to add to that or no. All right. And I will say last call for questions. And thank you so much to Laura, Sabrina, and Jeremy for your insight, for your advice, for your encouragement for taking on these types of pro bono environmental justice matters. I will say if anyone in the audience is inspired and looking to get involved, you should absolutely become a member of the ELI Pro Bono Clearinghouse. We are gonna have more of these types of community lawyering, CLEs that we've had two before, and we're holding, hoping to have them roughly every two months. They're a great way to stay current on EJ topics, community lawyering topics, and will hopefully help you in the types of cases that you take on pro bono. And again, I cannot stress enough that you should absolutely sign up for the ELI Pro Bono Clearinghouse and connect with us in other ways. We love to hear from you. We love seeing you at our events. And again, a big, big thank you to our fantastic panelists today. I know that I think conflicts are a little less mysterious after hearing from them. And yes, I'm going to turn it over to Madison now. Yes, thank you so much. Um, just want to say another big thank you to Christine, Jeremy, Laura, and Sabrina. We so appreciate your time helping us with this event. Um, and thank you to our audience for tuning in today. As Christine mentioned, this is the third part of our Community Lawyering for Environmental Justice series. You can find parts one and two online if you didn't get to attend the first two, and this one will also be posted um, if you'd like to share it with anyone who has some conflict checks questions. Um, that's it for today's webinar. Just thank you all again, and we hope you have a great day.